exact time of the full moon of Aquarius will not be until this coming Wednesday at 6.28 in the morning, but that's Mountain Standard Time. So if you're like Central Time, it's 7.28. If you're Eastern Time, it's 7.8. It's 8. It's 8.28 <laughs> in the morning. This means that we are now seven days within the seven days of intense Aquarian energies. So it actually begins uh, today, January 28th, and continues through February 3rd. So we have these seven days. Some people practice only five days, but I suggest if you've been a meditator, a practitioner of meditation and the teaching for several years, now you can expand that day from five days to seven days of um, increasing your sensitivity, your awareness, and your practice of putting the virtues of Aquarius into activity and um, in so doing, allowing your consciousness to expand each month, esotericists celebrate the full moon in spiritual recognition of the gifts from the Most High, which are bestowed in all kingdoms of nature. They recognize that the constellations stimulate their soul, our soul. And th what this stimulation does it activates things that are going on within our nature and through this activation allows us to bring forth Aquarian energy, Aquarian gifts out into our own field of work. Uh, our field of work may be our family life, it may be our group life, it may also include our work life, our professional life, um, whether it is local or universal. So we recognize that these constellations, whether it is Aquarius or Aries or Taurus or Gemini, all the 12 constellations actually stimulate our unfolding human soul and produce subjective activity and outer activity. To meditate at the time of the full moon is to charge our energy with the energies of the Most High. You know, this is very powerful. Uh, certainly is, you know, to most of us. And it's giving us a, a very deep reason as to why to take these five or seven days off every month to align ourselves no longer to our work or our sense of self-importance, but to align ourselves to the energy of the Most High. This is the greatest vitamin that we could ever swallow, is the, to align ourselves with the energy of the Most High. If you are able to prepare yourself each month in such a way that your consciousness can absorb the rays of the constellation, as Richard was reading this morning, in time we will begin to radiate his light and love and power through all that we do and feel and think. See, it is no longer a hypothesis. It is no longer the fact that we have the knowledge of the teaching. It is now we have the reality. We have the experience. We actually know it to be so. We know it to be factual. So each year, we're told for 12 years, if we meditate and pray at the exact moment of the full moon, absorb the rays of each constellation, 
then our unfolding soul is going to begin to ascend the mountain. Some people call it ascending Jacob's ladder. For it is in the absorbing of the rays of the constellation that we become increasingly subjective, active, and in fact, we begin to assimilate a fair measure of divinity from the Most High. So every 12 years, if we practice each month for 12 years, we will experience an expansion of consciousness. Okay, so what are the rays of Aquarius? The first ray or influence of Aquarius is the fifth ray. What this means is that our discipleship, those who practice the teaching, should work with facts and reality. That's the influence of assimilating and being sensitive to the fifth ray. When the fifth ray influences our life, we want to see facts and live factually. So I guess the question would be, well, what's the opposite of that? You know, if we're not living factually, then what are we living? We're living in fantasy. We're living in imagination. We're living in prejudice and bias and personal opinion. The bias and personal opinion and prejudice is not necessarily rooted in facts and reality. It's also not fantasy. So that may seem odd when, when people think of metaphysics, for example, or they think about individuals who are in the esoteric community. They think of people who are sitting at the top of a mountain or in a cave uh, and meditating their life away in a state of fantasy. Well, that used to happen, you know, back in the, what we call the Piscean Age, which was a very dangerous time spiritually and for humanity, we are told, because it was during that time that the Dark Ones slipped into and began to cohabitate with humanity because the meditators were not there. The true thinkers were no longer there. They were in the caves, in the mountains, in the Himalayas. So that's the past. So if now, now Aquarius is so important, why is it important? Because it's not just the sun this month going through Aquarius. Aquarius is lining up to the greater zodiac of Aquarius. So the, the 12 month, the 2500 month, the 250,000 month of Aquarius, everything is lining up now. So we are being challenged as a spiritual group and when I'm speaking a spiritual group, I'm not speaking just of the White Mountain education group, but groups all over the world that are universally now meditating. They're already beginning. You can see them on the webinar. I get deluge with email from groups all over the world that are now preparing to meditate together as a global community during these five or seven days of the full moon of Aquarius. We're going to bring this energy in. So the first influence of Aquarius is the ray five, which means that we must begin to live 
factually to be able to see the true facts. The fifth ray, in other words, is the ray of concrete science. The second influence comes from the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter, one of my favorite planets of all times, besides Venus, Actually, also, if you read in, in uh, if you spend any time reading uh, the writings and the teachings of Agni Yoga, you begin to recognize how important Jupiter and Venus are to the teaching and to the consciousness of disciples. So maybe I'm heavily influenced by that. Or because I have Aquarius rising, so Jupiter is very much a part of you know, my consciousness because of Aquarius or anyone who is aligned to Aquarius. Anyway, so Jupiter is a ray two, or a second ray planet, and it channels love, wisdom. Jupiter ties discipleship, those who are practicing the teaching, ties discipleship with the plan of humanity, which we call the hierarchical plan. Leadership must be infused with the influence of second ray, of love wisdom. Love wisdom is attached with the hierarchical plan and with Christ. So that's the second influence. The first influence is ray five, to live factually. The second influence is the ray of love wisdom. So not only are those who are aligning themselves and increasingly absorbing these influences of Aquarius living factually, but also balancing that with love and wisdom. Do you see how it's taking the old Piscean meditating in a cave where bats live, you know, <laughs> in the Himalayan mountains, bringing it back to facts and reality and love and wisdom. So now we're becoming perhaps better aligned with humanity and with the plan for humanity. Now there's a third influence and this third influence comes from the planet Uranus which channels the seventh ray. Now the seventh ray influence influences ideas and vision and great plans and brings the ideas and the visions and the plan into some kind of form or what we call manifestation. What's happening now is that perhaps we had an idea um, maybe 10 years ago during the full moon of Aquarius and each year, each year, each year during our meditation time, five to seven days of that meditation time, this idea has been precipitating. So slowly, slowly coming down through the spheres of consciousness and now is coming into form, coming into manifestation. So we are living in a cycle now in which some of our dreams that we may have been disappointed in that didn't manifest, this is a time potentially that they can come into existence. If you have faith, you can channel these energies. As a person, as a group, we can collect our mind, focus our mind, concentrate on these energies and bring them into the planet, into the earth, and direct them as leadership. And the reason I'm talking leadership is because a disciple is a leader. So we're bringing these energies into the planet and then directing them or transmitting them or exemplifying them to our family to our group and 
if the possibility exists then to our country. So it is that leadership that's going to be fortified by the energies now that we are sending, not just to our family and our group, but to the leaders of nations. This is why Christ said that it is so important to pray and to meditate for your leaders. I was watching a little bit of CNN this morning and uh, learning more about what took place at the World Economic Forum. And the first thing I heard and just kind of clouded everything else is that all the co-chair people were women. And you could see them all sitting on this stage. Wow. You know, that's a really big wow. And that's about all I can say about what I learned this morning. I was, <laughs> I was so blown away. <laughs> we must not only pray for our leaders, but also meditate for them. To meditate means to channel or direct energy. But how can we do that if we're not fused with the Aquarian energy? See, that's why we want to take this five-day or seven-day period now through Wednesday and begin to channel this energy to that stage of women that were co-chair people. also to the heads of our countries. This is the importance of the Aquarius full moon, to bring ourselves together and fuse ourselves with these energies so that we can make them available to those who are meditating and striving to do something good, but do not have the energies behind them. You know, they want to do good. They want to practice goodwill but they don't have the energy behind them. Energy follows thought, right? We can provide that energy for them. We can create a reservoir available to those who have the good heart, that want to practice goodwill, that want to and are intending to bring these great ideals into the human race and help the human race. This is where we can serve. So these energies coming down to earth, if you really have faith, is going to happen. Faith is not a religious phenomenon. Faith is the ability to tune ourselves with that energy or frequency and make it available for people so that they are fortified with the energy to work and to, through that process, inspire them. It's like, think of this, you know, that seems too abstract. Um, this is so cute. Uh, my former husband sent me a, a note a couple of days ago uh, about Barry Manilow. This is a singer that I used to just totally adore. And, and he is performing at uh, the Purple Cow in Sarasota, and the tickets are going like three and four and five hundred dollars. So Marshall said, you want to go? I'll take you. <laughs> he says, of course, I have to get a second mortgage on my house. Well, I'm kind of over Barry Manilow now. <laughs> So I sent him uh, a YouTube of El Devo, a couple of, you know, their YouTube performances. And he sent back the note and he said, I had goosebumps on my goosebumps. That's inspiration. See, that's just a simple little thing. But he got so inspired by the beauty of the music and, and the extraordinary uh, talent of these four men, you know, that individually they are extremely talented, but as a team of four men, each of them so have so perfected their talent that they can still get together 
in humility and make themselves even greater. So it's not only the music that's inspiring us subjectively, it's the unity, you know, that their perfection has brought them together and is now inspiring people all over the world with. So we can do this. We just have to have the faith that we can do it. The fourth influence in Aquarius comes from the moon, which channels the fourth ray energy. The, you know, I, I don't want to go into the esoteric side of it. I know you're kind of surprised when you say the moon. Well, the moon is, in fact, hiding, you know, another planet. But let's not be distracted by that, okay? And just say it's fourth ray energy that Aquarius through the moon is channeling. Okay, so the fourth ray is the ray of harmony through conflict. The effect of this influence on a national scale will be that nations can achieve harmony. Well, what I came away with this morning by listening to Farik for, for I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> It's Vakari, what, what is his name? Zakaria, thank you. Uh, is that even our president did a good job for the moment. <laughs> he, did a, he gave a really beautiful speech on economics. Okay, so now we're in this energy of Aquarius. It can, through the ray for influence on a national scale, <laughs> harmony. Harmony, so even if it was for a moment, it was there. Then we understand if this is the ray of harmony through conflict, harmony is going to be achieved but through conflict. So the conflicting forces are those forces that are materialistic. The World Economic Forum. We're going to have conflict. Again, conflicting forces are materialistic, separative forces, hateful forces, selfish and individualistic. So what does it mean to say forces. It, it means to me that, how can I explain it? It starts with energy. We said that energy follows thought. Okay, so, so hierarchy impresses the consciousness of initiates and disciples with a beautiful idea. These illumined beings take the idea, manifest it into something concrete. In the process of manifestation, energy changes into force. So that force goes into and creates a form. That form now will either be beautiful or filled with conflict. So it's, it's a very interesting um, science to consider, to think about, and to dialogue. It's like, um, this is a very simple idea, but let's say that mom and dad conceive and bring a baby into the world. The teaching says at that moment of conception, if mom and dad were thinking beautiful thoughts, and they had planned for that baby, they're bringing that baby from energy into form beautifully and constructively and positively, right? Okay, so that baby has a real good chance of being successful in this life. 
However, if the karma of that baby is as such that has to be paid off because of the history of the soul, now is where will comes in, free will. Now we set mom and dad aside that did their very best at conception to bring that beautiful baby into existence. Now it's up to the baby as it's growing up, the soul as it's unfolding. And is that soul aligning itself to its purpose, to the Most High, or is it going to get swallowed up in the forces of nature or form? So these are things to think about, you know, when we talk about, use these words, energy follows thought, and what is the difference between energy and force. Okay, so that's the fourth influence, which is harmony through conflict. The fifth influence in Aquarius is called the energy of Alcyone. Alcyone is one of the stars in the Pleiades. At the full moon of Aquarius, this star, we are told, precipitates energy to our planet through the constellation of Aquarius. And it's esoteric and exoteric and hierarchical rulers. So this energy creates striving and ever continuous victory over difficulties. Victory, what is victory? Victory does not mean to kill off other people. It means, or to render them useless. See, that's what we've been told. We go to battle to render everybody else useless, right? But that's not what victory means. It's not competition. It means the victory of our idealisms the victory of our freedom, the victory of our love, the victory of right human relations, and the victory of peace on earth. So in thinking about Aquarius and Jupiter and Uranus and Alcyon and the Pleiades, what is happening is in this whole process, just even in listening to the talk this morning about Aquarius, we are expanding our space. We are also expanding time. Now somebody is going to say, but there is no time. Oh really, as I'm looking at the clock and know I only have 25 minutes left and we have a meditation to put it, you can't tell me we don't have time. <laughs> but how do we expand time? Well, I've had the experience of what it means to expand time. For example, driving one day from California to Prescott, Arizona, it took three hours. Who does that? Who does that? That's called expansion of time. One day during the winter, my friend and I were driving on black ice and a car was coming to us. We were going to have a head-on collision. The next minute, which was actually about 10 minutes later, we were over in the ditch. Everybody else was driving by. They couldn't have cared less. What happened? Time slowed down. So we can manipulate time. We can expand time. We can expand our mental space. And we can expand the space of our vision. Whenever we expand our vision and space and time, we create healing in our bodies and minds and emotions. Whenever we are limited that accident could have happened. But the guiding hand came in and saved us by manipulating time. 
Whenever we are limited in time and space, we are sick. We cannot make right judgments. And we cannot have right human relations. Whenever we expand our mental space by thinking about the future, which is what we are doing here today, we're thinking about the future, we expand our horizon and become the cohabitants with what? Cohabitants with the stars. Instead of thinking that we are living on a planet in slavery, we must think we are citizens of what? Citizens of the universe. Citizens of the universe. These thoughts harmonize our energy with space, with the web of the energies that are sustaining the whole universe because we no longer think separatively, but in terms of space and the one existence. In thinking this way, we become healthy cells in the body of that huge manifestation. To expand our consciousness means our soul is ignited. Your soul, my soul, our soul, is ignited by the illumination of higher and higher frequencies of divine energy. All we have to do is take five or seven days out of the month and align ourselves to the influences of each constellation. In that expansion, we are able to be of greater service to our family to our group, our nation and humanity, and to the planet. So this occurs through our chosen field of service, through our life's purpose. As the disciples' consciousness expands, one day they will become initiated into a higher level of awareness where they become affected by the zodiacal influences which emanate outside of the solar system. They emanate outside of the solar system. This past week I was listening to NPR in an interview by an astrophysicist, a, a woman very young, she's in her 20s, and she discovered the first what you call it, the brown dwarf planet that's outside of our solar system. That's very exciting. Why aren't we doing that? <laughs> or maybe we are and we don't know. Parallel universes, you know. <laughs> that's fantasy. No, it's <laughs> Who knows, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but since we're supposed to be practicing the influence of Ray 5 today, and <laughs> reality, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just, it's the Gemini in me, you know, you can't help have a little humor here. <clears throat> okay. Zodiacal influences that emanate from outside of their solar system. This would be called the greater zodiac, you know, Pleiades, uh, certainly Sirius. When the sun is traveling through the constellation of Aquarius, an initiate is aware of the energy of Ray 1. Aquarius is associated with the great bear and thus Ray 1 that comes from the Great Bear. However, if your soul is not yet conscious of the greater zodiac, this ray is not going to stimulate your consciousness. It cannot. So the energy of Ray 1 is that of leadership in its truest sense. Some may say, well, how do you know this to be so? The answer is that you can learn about these things when you are in direct 
communication with your chalice, the chalice of your heart. Or in studying the writings of those who were in direct communication with the masters of the wisdom. For example, Helena Bolvatsky, she stated, listen to this, this is so powerful. She stated that all religion, all religion, let me repeat this, all religion and philosophy flow from the ancient wisdom doctrine held in custody by the planetary hierarchy. Do you want me to repeat this? <laughs> okay. Helena Blavatsky stated that all religion and philosophy flow from the ancient wisdom doctrine held in custody by the planetary hierarchy. I just, that's so profound. That's from uh, book four of the secret doctrine, book five of the secret doctrine. It can't be a book five. It says secret doctrine volume five. Well, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever typed this just was, fantasy land. <laughs> so as we engage in the practice of meditation and the spiritual disciplines of the ageless wisdom, we are going to find ourselves expanding in consciousness from one stage to another, awakening to greater mysteries and to our own existence, the existence of the capital S self and its relationship to the Most High. I'm going to skip through some things here. <coughs> I think I can cover this, maybe. Um, during the intense days of this full moon, today, Monday and Tuesday, especially the day of contact, which is Wednesday, and then we can go on for three more days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. There are certain things we must subjectively contemplate and then objectively take action. Breathing in, taking it in, breathing out, manifesting it. So the first one is to advance from self-centered consciousness to group-centered consciousness. That's Aquarius. As the human soul goes through the experience of Aquarius, he is challenged to eliminate the hindrances which cloud his light, the light of the soul, by testing the soul in ways that it will become so disgusted with its restrictions he will strive to eliminate the accumulated glamours and illusions, returning the chemistry back to the benevolent rays in order to prepare himself for participation in a discipleship group. The second action is as a member of a spiritual esoteric group to awaken to your group responsibilities. In order to awaken to your group responsibilities, you must become sensitive to the soul ray of your group as a whole. In other words, the group vibration. This requires changing the polarity of your consciousness from the lower mental plane to the higher mental plane and the chalice. The third action is transformation, to transform your level of consciousness from the earth to the universe. The fourth action, I'm speeding through here. <laughs> the fourth action is givingness. You must begin to spiral outward in order to give birth to your true self. 
giving this is a process of manifesting or giving birth to your true self. The fifth action is world service. We are told that the hierarchy at present has little more than 65 members. And in 1925, these members originated the new group of world servers. This new group of world servers is also called the group of conditioning souls. It, it was, I have to say this, it's so important, so we're going to run over a little bit this morning. It is believed that these souls, because of their point in evolution, because of their stage in unfoldment, and because of their impressibility to the group idea and plan for humanity, can come into incarnation and begin more or less to work out that plan and evoke a response to it to the human consciousness. This is the disciple. This particularly <clears throat> happened in 2012. I don't have time to talk about 2012, but it was a very important, very vital year to the implementation of the plan for humanity given to us by hierarchy and the Lords of Shambhala. This is the disciple or initiate engaged in world service to prepare the way for the coming of Maitreya. The sixth action is to radiate the spiritual life through your field of service. Whether your service is to take care of your family or to take care of the world or to take care of your planet to radiate the spiritual life through your field of service. This is the stage where the disciple no longer lives for himself, but for the world in all of his thoughts and emotions and actions. And I'm going to end there so we can have time uh, for Valerie to lead us in a, a really lovely meditation. <clears throat> 